greetings of peace and blessings. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, I would like to welcome all of you here today to this event. My name is Imam Soheib Sultan. I serve here as the full-time Muslim chaplain in the Office of Religious Life at Princeton University. It's our real pleasure and honor to have all of you here today. I see a lot of new faces in the audience. And I hope that this is the beginning of a long, lasting relationship uh, that we uh, forge out of this event today. That this is not your first or last time coming, but rather that you continue to keep coming to the Muslim Life Program events. The Muslim Life Program was established about nine years ago when I joined the university. And one of the things that we established very early on is this idea of Islam in Conversation series. The idea to bring scholars and thinkers and artists and activists to this campus, not only from the United States of America, but, but from throughout the world, in order to be in conversation with not only students, staff, and faculty here at the university, but the wider, larger community that exists around us. The idea of town and gown is a very important idea for us. We believe that the university is a place for everyone to gain education, for there to be illuminative talks, for there to be an opportunity to really grow in one's uh, heart and mind. And so we hope that, um, once again, you experience this space as such. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure is that everyone, when you were entering in, were given a piece of paper in which there's some highlighted events that we have for the rest of this semester. There's also an opportunity to join our email list. You can literally write out your name and your email, and you can hand it to one of the student volunteers on your way out. Or you can email us later to join the email list, but we'd love to keep in touch with you. Um, but on to our event today. Uh, we're very honored and happy to have Dr. Tariq Ramadan with us today. Um, this is his second time in our uh, time since the Muslim Life Program was founded. And today he's come at a really critical juncture, at a time in which there is much conversation about the future of Islam in the West, both in Europe and in America. And therefore his talk is on between globalization and nationalism, the future for Islam in the West. Dr. Tariq Ramadan comes to us as the professor of contemporary Islamic studies at Oxford University. He is the author of many books, including on being a European Muslim, on uh, the idea of pluralism, uh, he is the author of uh, works that are really essential to even, uh, I would say, Muslim religious and spiritual life, such as In the Footsteps of the Prophet. Interestingly, very recently, he published a book uh, that is entitled Islam, the Essentials. And one might ask, what is a great uh, public intellectual like Dr. Ramadan writing about the essentials of Islam? So maybe we'll ask him about that and why such books are still needed at this point. Um, so he's the author of many books, uh, and he's one of the most respected Muslim public intellectuals in the West. Um, before I give it over to Dr. Ramadan to offer some opening remarks, um, I want to ask how many of you in this room um, are uh, people who would consider themselves fans of soccer or more, uh, you know, more well known as football? Um, how many of you are fans? Okay, good. Uh, and the rest of you are missing out. Um, so the reason I ask is because this event today is going to feel a little bit like a soccer or football match in that there's going to be 45 minutes in which we begin, uh, of which we are part of, and then there's going to be an intermission because this is intersecting with the Muslim evening Maghrib prayer. And so there's going to be a 10 minute intermission for which people will be able to go and offer their prayers, and then we'll have the remainder of the second 45 minutes. Okay? So I just want to make sure that everyone knows that and you don't get too anxious about missing your prayers. No overtime? What's that? No overtime, no penalty kicks, nothing of that nature. It's all a fair game. 
So with that, uh, Dr. Ramadan, thank you, welcome, and without any uh, further ado, we'd love to hear your thoughts and reflections. Is that okay? Can you hear me? No. You can? No, but can you? <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Not really. Can you hear me? I think it might be better. Yes, can you hear me? No? Maybe I have to put it in the challenges and what I got from the title is that uh, trying to face uh, these challenges and to address some of the uh, critical uh, issues that we have when it comes to our situation in the West, our understanding in the, the, of the West, are the challenges between globalization and uh, 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 nationalism. So let me start with uh, something which for me it's essential in our understanding of what is happening today uh, in the West, and by the West, of course, what we are talking about here is uh, North American countries, Canada and the United States, and the European countries, or, and what is also happening in Australia. But we can also uh, widen the, the, the discussion with what is also happening in, in, in African countries, which is very close in some issues when it comes, for example, to what we see with populism and instrumentalization of emotional politics. But let me start with globalization and try to understand what is happening and why is it happening now within our society that we have trends and populist parties uh, taking over and even if they are not winning the elections, they are winning the public debate. In fact, the most important and the most dangerous thing that is happening today is not for us to see far-right parties winning the elections, but their rhetoric winning the political debate. And having traditional political parties, for example, on the uh, right-hand uh, side of the political spectrum, or the leftists, for example, repeating things that yesterday were said by far-right parties and now normalizing this in the discourse. This is, this is the big problem that we are facing. And we have to ask ourselves, where and why is it happening today? Why do, what are we facing that is pushing the people to come to this? While what we had as a positive concept is globalization is opening us towards the world. It's the global world, and we see exactly the opposite with the political positioning of some people in our country. And I think that we have to look and, and we have to understand what we are talking about when we are talking about globalization and where uh, the global world today is working and the global dimension. And mainly what we are facing is globalization on four different levels. The first one, and it's important because it has an impact, and we are very often underestimating this in our discussion, and especially when we deal with our respective governments. For example, when it comes to the States and when it comes to Europe, it's the global economy. The global economy is sending uh, a message to all the uh, 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 old entities that in fact things are not going to be decided and they are not decided at the, at the level of the government. You can have the government that you want, you are electing people, but the decisions are not taken at the level of the government. So you have people being elected, if you think today that Trump is making and deciding the political, the, 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 
the economy and the economic policy of this country, you are lost. And when Clinton was saying a few years ago, the people who are running this country are 1% of the people, he's talking about transnational corporations and they are t t he's talking about business people, the people who have the money. And why you have, for example, Trump now, we know that he got some support from transnational corporations and very, very wealthy people. And this is where the global economy has an impact on the reaction of people saying, who is deciding for us now? We are electing people and the decisions are not taken in our name, but by transnational corporations putting some pressure and lobbying within our parliaments, within our governments, and deciding whatever we decide, whoever we elect. So the sense that something is lost in local politics, because we have transnational corporation, because we have political economic forces and economic power deciding, uh, it's something which is what we called after the, after the 70s and the 80s, global economy and what is the neoliberal system that we are facing. And this has nothing to do with Islam and many people, they think that if they are targeted as Muslim, it's because it's against Islam. No, it's a common feeling that it's beyond Islam. It has to do with the reality of our societies. It has to do with something which is felt by citizens. And when you have the feeling that you are powerless in front of facing this economic power, you need to get the sense that uh, uh, it is going to have an impact in the way you look at the future of your country. So you come back to, we need to find a way where the decisions are taken at the local level. Look at the rhetoric of Brexit. It's all about this. It's at the European level that all the decisions are taken in economic terms. Let us come back to our country and forget about the reality of Europe. It's the sense that our power is lost, our uh, spheres of decisions are lost in the whole process of economic globalization. <coughs> this is one thing which is very important here uh, when it comes to, uh, 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 to this. The second thing which is connected to that is uh, uh, the second field that we, we, we have when it comes to globalization. And you ask yourself, what do you mean by globalization? Global economy is one dimension. The second thing which has an impact, and has an impact uh, in something which is not so rational, but very much having to, to, to do with our feelings, is the global culture. And the global culture uh, has also something to do with our way we deal with our old references, for example. So the global culture is you might like it or not, but you can feel, for example, that what we call uh, the global culture today is very often felt by the global south as the westernization of the world. So global culture is, wherever you go, it's the Hollywood uh, culture that is uh, uh, taking uh, over. And with all the product, what we eat, or the way we drink, the way we dress, has to do with this global culture. So you can have this being perceived as very dangerous because we are losing our old references in our world. And the first reaction is, let us come back to our identity because our identity is lost in the whole process. So in the West, what we have, it's something that you may not feel, but depending on how you deal with this global culture, is going back to us and saying, who are we in this? The old references are lost. So you have the feeling that your power is lost, that decisions are taken far from your decision, and then the culture is not, is not in direct relationship with your feeling and the way you look at the world, and things are coming uh, uh, from other sources and, and shaping a culture which is not the old uh, culture that you knew. Add to this that uh, uh, the, the, the sources of this global culture are not clear. It's coming from some very powerful production of culture. And this is what we have in sociology when the people like, for example, Foucault or Bourdieu was talking about the cultural capital. So who is producing culture is also producing power, the power of representing the world. We have to deal with this because at one point, all the people who are with this creating these cultures of us versus them, our values versus your values, are coming to this. 
are coming back to this perception. So the global culture here is, is also part of what we call globalization. What is going to be connected with the global culture is the global communication. It's the global network. It's the social media. It's all these means that are, in fact, producing a culture. And you might think, for example, that when you deal with Facebook and when you deal with Twitter, when we deal with all these means, you're only dealing with means. That's not true. These means are creating a culture. There is a culture of Facebook. There is a culture of social media. And the, the way you have to deal with this is also creating something which is shaping mindset and feelings. So the global world now, the fact that you can be connected to the people around the world, it's also something which is creating through Facebook and through all the social media, uh, uh, a sense of uh, 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 connection, but also with the res research that we had in the world, something which is completely new. The sense, for example, that you deal with all these uh, uh, means and you know that these means are not only means, but the people who are dealing with means, or these means, are very powerful. You know, for example, that in your country, your president paid $15 million to hire Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is a very powerful uh, 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 transnational corporation dealing with that data on internet, and they were able to gather data from 200 uh, million people and getting the data to tailor uh, emails to everybody, knowing what you are going to look for and what you are doing on internet. Very powerful means saying that at one point, we can send you an email, you think it's for you, but it's based on the data that we gather coming from your activities on internet. Cambridge Analytica are the same who are supporting Brexit. And two weeks before the election, they were saying it's going to be a surprise in the United States of America. In Brexit, they said that it's possible that Brexit was going to win even Johnson, Boris Johnson, who was supporting, was not so sure that this was going to happen. So the reality of this global, this power, dealing with culture, the global culture, based on the culture production of representation and the culture coming from the means when it comes to communication, this is very powerful. And you have a sense that you are, yes, alternative ways to get information but at the same time, you are facing with a very powerful world to the point that it's nurturing something which is now very problematic in our way of dealing with news and fake news, <coughs> is everything is possible. You are behind your screen. There is, uh, your name is not there. People are talking. Some people are spreading around. And you have even a president. He doesn't even care about what is he, if what he's saying is right or wrong. He's saying it and it's spreading around. So this culture is something which is, because of the scale, is sending us back something which is a sense that we are lost in all this. Where is truth in all this? Where is truth? So global economy, global culture based also on uh, uh, the global means, the global uh, uh, communication. and. Uh, uh, there is one last thing which is important when it comes to this, is uh, uh, a, a phenomenon that we have now. And yesterday, countries like the United States of America and Canada were looking at it as something which was very positive. Is the global migration process. The reality of migrating, the people migrating. So what we have now, it's uh, the global world or the globalization, the way we were looking at it first is just now we are connected. So we, we would be happy to see people migrating. And the reality is that there would be no United States of America without migration. It was positive. It was the country helping and welcoming immigrants. This is where the identity was based on pluralism, based on migration. And exactly the same with Canada. 
And look at what is happening now. It's happening that now migration is perceived as a big problem to the point that we want to build walls between the South and the United States of America, which is exactly the opposite of what the philosophy of this country was. And the global world on this, or perceived as a world where the people can move now, no, the people should not move, but money should move. So let the mon money move very quickly and let the people stay where they are. And meaning here that if you look at all this, if you are happy, because we are talking about the global economy, for the money to move very quickly and the people to stay where they are, it means that the connection here once again is how are you dealing with your old references, how are you going to deal with your own culture, and then how you are going to deal with your own country. The reaction to this has nothing to do first with Islam and with a, pers uh, 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 a specific religion. It's a human reaction to globalization by saying, let us come back to the old references because we are lost today. Lack of clear identity, lack of clear sense of power at my level. You are talking about uh, participatory democracy, but are we really choosing? Look at what is happening. And by the way, the last elections were very uh, uh, clear on the fact that there is something which is going wrong in the political arena. So, having said that, when we look at all what is happening now, we can see that uh, there is a sense that our power is lost and there is a sense that we are no longer in security. Why this is also important, so we are not in security and we have to be very uh, uh, cautious first with the economic power, with politicians that are not doing the job, and with the reality of migrants coming in the country and for some of them taking over. You had in this country some scholars talking about Europe and saying, you know what, Europe is lost. It's Arabia. Arabs are taking over. Migrants and Muslims are taking over. Europe is lost. On the, Arabia was a philosophy saying, be careful. So my sense when I was coming here 15 years ago is that we are not going to get this, this uh, uh, narrative here because this is exactly the opposite of the United States of America. But this is exactly what is happening now. You have a president saying, I'm going to ban Muslims. And he's saying this and he's raving with the people who are going to vote for him because he's saying something which is playing with the feeling of the people you are not in security. And with migrants, there can be terrorists coming. And there can be Muslims. And these Muslims are going to change the country. So the narrative behind, it's not based only on Islam, but Islam and Muslims and black people and oppressed people are going to be the instruments of this reaction to the global world. And we need to get the big picture. Because our understanding of the whole thing should not be Muslims responding to Islamophobe, understanding that it's only against Islam. It's the big picture that we need to get. Why? Because we have to come together. If we want to respond to this, it's not about black people or Latinos or uh, Americans or Muslims. Okay, okay, we are the victims and we are uh, in a fragmented reality. We need to get the big picture and to understand how this global world, based on global economy, global communication, global culture, has an impact on the way we are going to react at the local level. So we need to get the big picture. Because there is only one thing which is important. The future of Muslims and Islam in the West is only going to be when Muslims are going to understand that they are not alone responding to the challenge. They have to come with their fellow citizens. Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, agnostics, Hindu, Buddhists, whoever. We need to understand the big picture. And we need to understand why the people are reacting like this. Because in this world, our old references, our old sense of identity and power, they are all lost. The communication that we have in our living room is telling us this is more powerful than anything that you can do. It's very powerful. It's even watching you. And it is. Remember, you know, I always, I was surprised to have 
President uh, Barack Obama sitting with young people, they were asking him, I want to be with you, like you, in, uh, I want to be like you in the future. And the first response he gave is that, so forget about Facebook. <laughs> what is he saying? Be careful. That's not only a space where you can deal and be connected. You are watched. And the people know. And now we have the answer. The data that the people can get out of your activity is letting them know your psychology. You, the way you are going to react to this. So through the psychology, I'm going to give you exactly the political statement and the political discourse which is necessary to influence you. So it's undermining what? The, the democratic process. If I can get your mind, I will get your vote. And if I'm watching you, so, so we have to be quite clear here. It's very powerful and people are putting money and at the end of the day, the one who has the money to buy the service of Cambridge Analytica is going to get it. $15 million just to have emails sent to the people as opposed to what Obama was doing or done, ha, did before by trying to get people giving some money and to raise you know, awareness at the grassroots level is another way to deal with politics. And the same company working to bre with Brexit and winning <coughs> where at one point it was Unbelievable that something like this could happen in the, in, 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 in the UK. So it was playing on fear and the sense of if you come back to the UK, you come back to do your nation, if you are bringing back this sense of nationality, you are going to be protected. So a sense of security within your nation. Come back to the nation state, this is where you are going to be secure. Come back to your identity. And just after Brexit, people looking at Muslims, go back home now. Go back home. And having a sense, now we came back to our identity. So this reaction to the global war is coming with, with this overall understanding that we need to get when it comes to this. Now, having said this, it's, uh, what would be the, the reaction to that? The first reaction that we have is all what we see today. When the people are starting to talk about identity as an answer to the global world, this is the starting point of the populist approach. The identity business is, you know what? In a, in a world where you are lost with global economy, global culture, global means and all this, come back to your identity, define who you are. And at one point, in a, migrant, in a society which was based on migration like the United States, you can be a Latinos, you can be a black, you can be an African-American. In fact, what was important is you, 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 you feel that you are part of the society and that America is your country and America, by definition, is a pluralistic society. When you have a president being able, America first, and defining the identity of the Americans by saying some people are going to be banned, and some people, we have to protect ourselves from some religious identity, is reducing the notion of what is the hyphen identity that we had before, which is exactly following in the footsteps of the populist in Europe. And the populist in Europe, what they are saying, if you want to come back to a sense of security in the global world, what is important is to define your identity. And what is going to be the first question that you have when it comes to identity is, who are you first? Who are you first? Are you first an American? Or are you first a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim? These questions, we had them for over the last 15 years in Europe. Who are you first? Are you first a French? Or are you first a Muslim? Are you first a Swiss? I was asked this question. I'm a Swiss by citizen, by, as a citizen, by nationality, and the question asked, are you first a Muslim? Or are you first a Swiss? My answer was to question the question by saying, silly question. <laughs> I'm both. <laughs> And both because we have multiple identity. The first answer, what Amartya said, I mean Malouf, when they came to tackle the question of identity, they were saying the, the resistance to people trying to reduce our, our identity to one thing, which is your nationality, the best resistance is to say we all have multiple identities. No one has, and this is why I kept uh, re repeating for years, 
I'm Swiss by nationality, Egyptian by memory, uh, European by culture, uh, princi uh, universalist by principle, Moroccan by adoption, <laughs> and a man, because it's part of your identity to be a man and to be a woman. So to say that you have, not, but that's very important, it's not a joke. It's really the starting point of the discussion when it comes to how are you going to deal with uh, the, the identity business. All the populists today, and what is happening in this country, are, are responding to this globalization and this sense of loss by saying identity should be part of politics. And when you start talking about politics through the, 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 the notion of your identity, what are you going to do? You are going to have the four characteristics of populism today, which are all based on this type of nationalism. It's not only nationalism. It's not only my country first. It's based on my country first as to the intellectual framework, and it's all based on emotions. So the sense that the way you are going to react to the global world, it's based on an intellectual reaction nurtured by emotions. What do we have in the populist discourse? All the people who are now saying, my nation first, my nationality first. The first uh, things that we have is the way they define us. Who is this us you are talking about? You know, in the discussion that we have, I had in, in Europe, it was with Aznar, who was the former uh, Spanish prime minister. He was looking at me and he was telling me, us, in our culture, and I, I smile and say, who is this us you are talking about? And say, us, Europeans, I say, who is this us you are talking about? Who am I in this picture? <laughs> am I outside? For him, the only fact that I was a Muslim with this face, which is not exactly a, the European face that he was thinking we should have, was putting me outside. The identity approach is based on this. It's the way you are saying us, and you are going to define us versus them. So you need an other. You need to create otherness. In the global world, where there is nothing like this, the best is come back to the nation state and define the nations, us versus them. And then you have to create the them. The otherness is part of, so the populist approach is all about this. For months in this country, if you were listening to Trump's rhetoric, it's about creating an other, always them, banning this. It's all about this, it's all about this. And by the way, when I enter in your country, this is the first time after six years that I was stopped at the border the day before yesterday. And it was quite funny because they, they stopped me and say, we wanted you to know that we know that you are here. <laughs> <laughs> so I smile and I say, I don't worry. I knew that you know. <laughs> what do you want to say? What is the, what, why are they stopping me? To just send a message and the feeling that you know, we know that you are coming. You know, the feeling that there is something. So the feeling is to work on the psychology of the people. The populist discourse as a nationalistic reaction to the globalization, or globalization perceived as the way, is something which is us to be defined versus them. This is one. So uh, polarization in the way. The second is based on emotional politics. You don't define us based on our common values. No, it's the emotion, what was lost, the way we were. It's for example to play with the, the emotion of the people. You know yesterday how, how, how secure we were, how, how, how we were all white. <laughs> Look at what is happening, not so white. The dress is not exactly ours. They are talking in broken English, broken Dutch, broken whatever. And we play with this, us versus them, based on emotional politics. This is the second characteristic. And once again, if you were to listen Trump's rhetoric, it was all based on very emotional thing. To the point that he can say silly things and it's very powerful emotionally speaking. Be careful with this because it's very, it's very tricky. Once, 
I was dealing with the leader of the UDC, which is the, the far right party in Switzerland. You cannot imagine how <coughs> superficial he was and how bad he was. And you end up talking to him, and not because you are good, but he, because he's so bad that you win the battle. You win the argument. It's so silly that you win the argument. You think that by winning the argument, you win the battle. <laughs> but that's not true. You win the argument, and he wins the battle. Because he said, I told you, they are very dangerous. So you think you are very happy to say, so silly things that you're saying. Say, I told you, this is exactly it. They are very dangerous. So it's not an intellectual reaction to what you say. It's uh, an emotional reaction. Say, oh, yes, that's very dangerous. So the fact that yesterday you were asked, for example, in France, the people are saying, you need to know what the secular se laicite is, secularism. When you come and you explain what is the secular system, say, wow, now they know they are very dangerous. <laughs> so what is you are gaining intellectually, you are losing emotionally. Because the people are playing with this. So winning the argument is not enough. You need to, to get a sense of how are you going to deal with the emotion of the people. And this is why you can't just react in a rational way to something which is irrational. It's playing with this emotion. The third dimension of this, which is what we see as the nationalistic reaction and the populist reaction to this, it's uh, 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 playing with fear. We are, uh, the people are taking over, the people are taking, uh, uh, are now, uh, there are uh, hundreds and thousands and millions coming. This rhetoric that we had in, uh, uh, for example, you heard, of course, about Get Wilders in the, in the Netherlands. He had a very short video just showing the number of Muslims that are going to come to the country and saying, in 2050, Muslims are going to be the majority in this country. And by the way, they are already a majority in this city, in this city. And he's, taking, he's coming with facts, saying, we are colonized. So it's a, a, a culture of fear. A culture of fear, what is the consequence of the culture of fear? It's, we need security. And security is not based on, we need more schools, we need social justice, no. We need security, police, we need prisons, we need the, the security apparatus which is exactly what you have in this country when the people are dealing with black people and say, you know what, in inner cities, the question is not about social justice. The question is, we need more jails, we need more prisons, and we ask the private uh, uh, corporations to buy and to, to, to build prisons for us to get, and for them to get more money based on the security policy, and it works. So it's, a, it's structural, it's not only something which is, we need to get this as part of a policy. So, Fear and security are the third aspect. The last one is something that it's connecting nationalism and all this question about identity, us versus them, emotional politics, fear and security with victim mentality, victimhood. So in fact, we are victims of the people who are coming, so we have to protect ourselves. We need to secure our borders. So this is also something which is part of the nationalistic and the nationalism, nationalism that we have now. It's all about protecting ourselves, we are victims. So when you look at this and you look at the reaction, we need to understand that it's beyond the only fact that we have Muslims in the West and Western Muslims. It's something which is, uh, it's in fact, even a transnational. Something that I was not, expecting, for example, you go to Ivory Coast, where uh, African people were coming from Christian tradition, Muslim tradition, and, and uh, uh, traditional spiritualities, in, and they were living together. And all of a sudden, everything changed. In the name of this, exactly the same tensions is that our identity, we are a Christian country, we are a Muslim country, and then the political game is about what is your identity? So we had it in Rwanda, we had it in Ivory Coast, we had it in, uh, in uh, Central Africa. It's happening in, 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 in uh, Burkina Faso. It's happening in, uh, it happened in, in Senegal. So you have this business, it's everywhere. 
and it happened, of course, in Malaysia, I was there, when the people were saying the, the Malay culture versus the Christian culture versus the Chinese who are present. We have this everywhere. So it's not only something that is happening in the West, it's something which is transnational. It's, it's global, in fact. And we have exactly the same reaction. And Muslims, by the way, in Muslim majority countries, are as emotional than the Western people in the West, exactly the same. And we also have, in Muslim majority countries, populists playing with your identity or your Muslim identity versus the others. We have exactly the same process. So, so we need to get it right and to understand how we're going to deal with this and in which way we have to, to deal with, with this. So, uh, having uh, or facing this, how are we going to work with that? Is it enough now? And I was part of this uh, tradition when I was starting to, to write about Western Muslims, for example, I say, in fact, uh, we need to be citizens, we need to be involved in the society, we have to show that there is no contradiction between being a Muslim and being an American or being a Canadian. At the beginning when I was saying this, many Muslims were saying, stop it, silly things. Once I came here, in, you know, it was not so, 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 uh, long ago, when I remember that after six minutes, when I came to one of the Muslim conventions, it was in two. It was before 2001. Mm -hmm. I started talking about being an American and being a Muslim and being an American Muslim. I was asked to stop that after six minutes because this was not. No, this is not. That was not good. I was pushing it too much. Now it's becoming, you know, mainstream. You have to be an American Muslim. That's good. Okay, that's all good. But the problem is, what does it mean? What does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean now to be part of uh, the society? And how are we going to react to this? So you have many options. One of them is to fall into the trap of the populist rhetoric. They are talking about identity, so you talk about identity. Mm -hmm. They are saying us versus them, so you say, no, no, us, it's, it's not us versus them. We are part of the things, and in order to show you that we are part of you, we are going to remove what is making you feel that we are the other. So at the end, as we have today, people expecting from the Muslims in order to be good Americans, or good Canadians, or good Europeans, or good Westerners, we have to be less visible. So the good Muslim is the invisible Muslim. And if you cannot change your color, at least change your dress. Okay? Just make it something that, and don't talk too much, and don't, don't be visible. Be humble enough to understand that this is the only way for you to be accepted. To be accepted is to be invisible. History, and recent history, showed exactly the, the, the opposite, that the more we have been here, first, second, third, fourth, fifth generations, after a while, of course we are going to be visible everywhere. And this is what is happening. In fact, the history of the uh, Muslim settling in the West is a success. Contrary to what is said by the politicians, oh, you are not interpreting, of course, we don't have a problem, uh, uh, and this is what millions of Muslims in the West are showing day in, day out. We don't have a problem being Muslims in the West. The problem now is this new rhetoric, this nationalism and populism that is coming as a reaction to globalization, finding a target, finding people through which we can create the other. And who are the people, part of the people in the West, who are helping us transnationally to deal with the other are the Muslims. Why? Because yesterday we were talking about Pakistani in the UK, Turkish in, in Germany, we we're talking about Arabs in France, or we were talking about uh, Pakistani or Turkish here, and all of a sudden they are all Muslims. Common threat. So they're all Muslims now, and we are talking about Islam, and we are not talking about the nationality, we are talking about a common threat with people coming, and there are millions, and the figures are showing that every year there are going to be more and more coming. And even now, with what is happening in Syria, five million uh, refugees in, in uh, Turkey and in uh, uh, Lebanon, they are coming, and among them, of course, let's say that uh, some terrorists are going to come just to add to fear and security. So it's the big story that we have now. How are we going to deal with this? By only saying that we are citizens, we have to be very clear on 
our understanding of the big challenges here. And there are big challenges. And I would say that uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm asked to, to deal with this, coming from an Islamic viewpoint, because this is the question today, is, is, is what do we do from an Islamic viewpoint with this, is first to avoid falling into the trap of this identity business. When the people are saying, what is your identity? They want you to say, when they are saying, your first identity is to be an American, they want you to say, my first um, uh, identity is being a Muslim. Willing it or not, this is who I am. So you answer to this exclusive definition of identity with an exclusive definition of identity. You don't question the question. This is a trap. This is a trap. Depending on what you are asking, you know, for example, you say, are you first a Muslim or are you first an American? You have to be smart enough to say, no, if I'm dealing with my death, I'm, I'm first a Muslim because the, the meaning of my life is, is to deal with God. So when it comes to voting, I'm first an American. When I, it comes to my death, the philosophy of life, I'm first. So depending on the context, your identity, and this is why in, in, in I always uh, uh, remind the story of uh, Amartya Sen when he was uh, once uh, talking to me and he was saying, you know this story when he was saying, you can be at the same time a poet and a vegetarian. <laughs> you can be both. So depending on the context, the first is going to be who you are. If you go to eat, that's not the time to say I'm a poet. <laughs> and when you go to, to a circle of poets, it's not the time to say, you know what, I'm a vegetarian. The context is putting the first, but that's, that's very simple, but essential. Because it means that we have multiple identities and one can come first depending on where you are with whom you live. The first reaction to this identity business, all this thing, is to avoid falling into that trap. But to do this, you have to be confident enough with your own values and your own understanding of who you are. And this is where the answer to what is happening now and to this uh, reaction to globalization that we have everywhere is to come back also to a deep understanding of who we are and not only as beings, but I would say that uh, we need to reconcile ourselves with something which is our deep philosophy of life and not only playing with you know, these political uh, realities that we have. How are you going to deal with politic of, politics of fear? How are you going to deal with politics of identity? How are you going to deal with emotional politics? How are you going to deal with all this? The problem that I have to deal with the Islamic discourse very often is it's a reactive discourse. It's a, a discourse on the defensive. So, in fact, we are not setting the discourse. We are responding to questions. And we are falling into traps very often because who has the power? The one who is setting the question has the power to direct even your own answer. And if you don't take a step back and say, ask yourself, what is my philosophy of life? What are my priorities? The people are going to set the priorities for you to the point that even in our understanding of our religion, we end up putting things that are secondary as a priority because the people are telling us, you have this problem. So for example, the people are pushing on some of the, the issues when it comes to your problem as the Muslims is violence. And we are almost, you know, I would say that 98% of all the invitation I get in the media is to talk about this. Tell me something about radicalization, tell me something about violence. So we end up having a discourse which is apologetic of saying, oh, no, no, that's not us. We are nice. <laughs> and uh, you, you keep on repeating that you condemn you know, Daesh and Boko Haram, say, why don't you speak, why don't you speak more about this? I say, look, we every day we are saying, and the problem is not that we don't speak, it, the, the problem is that you don't hear. <laughs> so you are pushed to come to some of the issues, and then you have some issues that are always there. When you talk about Islam now, in the West, depending on the country, every country has a specific list 
If you go to France, the first question is headscarf. If you come here, it's violence. If you go to uh, Holland, it's homosexuality. You want to know what? You have a problem. And the Muslims end up putting the priority on their answers to the priority of their questions. Well, you have to take a step back and say, look, that's not going to work like that. To the global world, we need to come with a global understanding of what we are doing. So I want to come to the discussion not at the level of the consequences of globalization, but at the level of what globalization means to me. And this is where I think that what is important today, one of the main challenges of Muslims in the West, is to reconcile themselves with their cosmology, with their, their, their philosophy of life. Their cosmology, don't come at the level of I'm answering your question. No, I'm, I want to deal with the global picture. What do I do with the glo this global world? Am I going to accept global economy the way it is, global you know, politics and, and talking to me about the democratic process where there is no rights for us and we are losing our rights day in, day out? What is the, so this is where, for example, uh, and I will uh, surprise some of you, when it comes to cosmology, the first reaction to emotional politics is a deep spiritual understanding. A deep spiritual understanding is, is the way I look at the world. If today we want to deal with globalization, what is your take on, what are you saying when you are saying there is no God by God? The spiritual, the first axis of Islam, the starting point of Islam is Tawheed, is there is one God. But what does it mean there is one God? There is one God means your life has a meaning, you better now defend the meaning of life. And you have to respect life. It means straight away in the global world, even if you are telling me that money can travel and people are not, by the very definition of my cosmology, we give dignity to human beings, I will never ever put my nationality before humanity. Never. I myself was saying to Muslims, be a citizen. And then I understood that this could be distorted to the point that I have now people coming to me, Muslims who are citizens, French, British, American, and the way they deal with humanity is through a nationalist way. That they don't really care about people dying in the Mediterranean Sea or refugees, they care about I'm accepted as an American. That's distorted. So when you bring back your cosmology, there is one God and one humanity. And there is no difference between human beings. So what I have to do when I am in America is never to accept America first. It's America and all the human beings. God bless America and all the others. No, but it's not a joke. Is the starting point of your answer to the global <laughs> world. If not, you end up to show that you are a good American to fall into the trap of this reaction that is going to be instrumentalized. We have to come back to the big picture. And the big picture is I have a, I have a philosophy of life. And the starting point, if, if I say there is no God but God, it means that my spirituality comes first. I have to resist any temptation of reducing my belonging to my nationality or my community. I will never, as a Muslim, say my community first. There is nothing like this in Islam. If my community is wrong, I have to stand up against my own community. Help your brother when he's right or wrong. How am I going to help him when he's wrong? I'm going to stop him from doing wrong. So there is nothing like right or wrong in Islam. So when you reconcile yourself with the deep understanding of what do you have to do? What is your mission on it? What is your mission when you say there is only one God? Wherever you are, الذين إن مكناهم في الأرض أقاموا الصلاة وأتوا الزكاة وأمروا بالمعروف ونعمة. Wherever you are, what I have to do is, of course, the connection with God is my prayer. The connection with the people is to be connected to the poor people wherever they are and then to command what is right and to resist what is wrong. Not only for Americans, not only for us versus them, for 
everybody. The power of this message, this spiritual message, is no difference. We are not going to go from globalization to very narrow nationalism. That's prohibited by the very definition of my cosmology, my understanding of the universe. More than that, Al Khalifa, it's not Al Khalifa coming from what we have now in, uh, in Daesh, the Islamic State, and with the Khilafa, with it, which was reduced to a political system. In Islam, we understand something which is part of our cosmology, and we have to reconcile ourselves with this. One of the great challenges of Muslims is that now we are obsessed with the rules and we forget the philosophy the big picture of what does it mean to be a Muslim today? What is your contribution to this country? The United States of America needs more philosophy, more humanism, more understanding of what it means to be part of the humanity. This country needs a new philosophy, a new understanding of what it means to be human beings. Don't tell me now that as Americans, because you have economic power, we are going to lecture the world. Who are going to lecture if we go and you see what is happening in your jails? The way you are treating people, the way you are treating black, uh, uh, the, the racist country that you have, what is happening with black Americans, with the Latinos, with the people who are underground in this country, and the way you are treating people in, our, in your jails. It, let's say what we were hoping was, uh, with uh, Barack Obama, that Guantanamo is going to be closed. The way you are treating people, you know today that in Guantanamo, people are innocent. It is known and they have been in jail for 12, 14 years and silence. In your jail, you have solitary confinement. People who are on their own, years. They don't know even what is the day, when is the day and what is the day. And you go and you lecture the people about humanity. You don't lecture, you have to listen. But if you are true Americans, you have to be the added value within the society. It's to come back to the deep meaning of what is a philosophy of life? What is the meaning? What is to be dignified? What we need in the United States of America is voices helping this country to be more dignified in economic terms, in social terms, in cultural terms. This is, but it, it takes some courage. But first, it comes to the big picture, what I was saying, as the big picture, the beginning. And when I'm saying this, it's, uh, uh, to understand the very meaning. When I was writing to be a Muslim, I was against and I was reacting to, you, you know that in our tradition as Muslims, coming from the, the scholars of the Middle Ages, they were saying in Islam, if you look at the world, there is Dar al-Islam and Dar al haq Dar al-Islam is the space where the Muslims are in majority, are, they are in security, and Dara Putni was saying, for example, a scholar was saying there are four characteristics that are helping us to know what is Dar al-Islam, when the government is Islamic, when the legal system is Islamic, when the, you have the owner of the land, you are the owner of the land, and when you are in majority. These are four characteristics dealing, this is Dar al-Islam, and everything else is Dar al-Harq. Potentially you are at war. And scholars, at the, during the 20th century uh, were, were saying, no, we have to, this is outdated, we have to change this. Because in fact, to tell you the truth, you might be more in security in society where you are not in majority than you are in society where you are in majority. So many of the Muslim majority countries are dictatorship, you are not in security. You cannot express yourself. So I might be more in security in, uh, in the West than I am in Muslim majority country. So it doesn't work. And it was questioned. What we have coming from scholars, they were saying, in fact, we need to talk about Dar al aqd which is the contract. Al -ahd, or, uh, there is a contract between us and the society. And some were even saying Dar al dawah where we are spreading the word of Islam. And my reaction to this, and look at why I'm saying this, is say, no, I don't agree with both this uh, uh, way of talking. Because when you speak about Dar al dawah you are recreating this Muslims and the other. Dar al-Aqt, or our al -Aqt, it's a contract between us and them. And I think this is not our situation now. So when you have some scholars speaking about us in non-Muslim majority countries as something which is not the, na the natural way of saying no. Now if we are 
Americans, or if we are Can Canadians, or if we are Europeans, we are at home. So how do we have to deal with being at home? What we are at home, we are witnesses to our message before you people. So it's not a shahada. This is what we bear witness to our message. We have, and what I am expecting from a Christian, what I am expecting from a Jew, what I am uh, expecting from people who are, have no religion, for example, I want them to show me, out of their behavior, the principles they have. Be the witness of what you believe in. So we are witnesses, and Muslims should be witnesses in this country of their principles. So they are at home in this country, and this is a space where we want them to be witnesses. What does it mean? How are you going to be witnesses? By the way you dress? No. By the way you, uh, you are the other? No. By the way you have this ethical distinctiveness. That you have principles, that you are principled, and you are not going to accept to be the, uh, 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 to play the game of the emotional politics. So this is once again coming with the cosmology. That we are witnesses and this world doesn't, does not belong to us. We are vicegerent. We are trying our best. And you know why is it important to come back to this? Who in this country was having exactly the same philosophy of life from the very beginning? In fact, when the Europeans came to the United to, to America and decolonized this land. They were dealing with Indians and natives. What did they say? They say, we thought that we were belonging to the land. There is a connection between us and the land. You came and you said, no, the land belongs to us. You changed the whole thing. The Islamic message is closer to the native narrative not colonizing the land, serving the land. So this is why, why is it, for example, that many American Muslims are completely absent of anything which has to do with Native Americans, for example? How is it? That in Canada, for example, when I went there recently, that people, the First Nations, they are calling them the First Nations, are saying, where are you in this discourse? Don't you have a philosophy respecting belonging to the land and the lands and, 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 and the, the reality of... So you are against colonization in Palestine, but you are okay with colonization in Canada and in the States because it suits you? Because you are ready to forget? No, at least there is an acknowledgement that there is something which is history here that has to be respected. Native Americans with their philosophy need to get a discourse coming from the new American Muslims and all the others saying, we acknowledge the struggle and uh, the fact that you are part of this country, that we cannot exploit people. Exploitation, we by definition, as witnesses to our message in the world, we are always on the side of the oppressed. I'm not asking you your religion. I don't look at your color. You are oppressed, I'm on your side. You are an oppressor, I'm against you, even if you are a Muslim. Even if you are a Muslim. This powerful message, don't you think that if we come back to the spiritual dimension here, is the first answer to the global reality, and it's avoiding us to fall into the trap of all this nationalistic, <coughs> populist reaction. It's exactly the opposite. So the spiritual challenge here, I'm sorry to say, if I look at what we are teaching to our kids in the West, cosmology is not there. The sense that you have a mission, that you need to be here as a witness before people, is not there. The only thing that we have, which is falling exactly into the trap of the whole narrative, is protect yourself from the society. In fact, we are doing with al-halal wal haram what the nationalists are doing with emotional reaction to the world. It's a sense of isolation. To protect yourself with the halal haram is fine, but don't, if you don't have a vision of what is your mission and how are you going to promote the principles, if you don't have a philosophy of the rules and you think that you are going to protect yourself only with the rules, forget about it.
the battle is lost. What is now essential when it comes to globalization is to have a narrative which is as powerful as the narrative which is the populist reaction to globalization. And it starts with the spiritual understanding, the sense of humanity, the fact that now we have people in the United States of America who care about what is happening around them. And it means what? And I will stop with the, uh, am I still, uh, uh, I took too much time, isn't it? You let me go. Okay, so, so, uh, So just to, to end, I, I, will, I will go to my conclusion here. Having said this, and how we have to, so, so I would say that one of the main challenges that we have when it comes to us in, in the West is understanding what is happening, not to make it something which is against us as Muslims. It's deeper than that, and because it's deeper than that, it's even more dangerous. And we have a role to play in the whole thing. And the role to play in the whole thing is to come back to our, uh, what I call the cosmology, the way we understand our relationship to God, our relationship to the environment, our relationship to the, to the society. But not only this, by the fact that we are reconciling ourselves with the deep philosophical questions and religions and spiritual questions, helping our fellow citizens to do exactly the same as Christians, as Jews, as even the native. You see, we have to reconcile uh, ourselves with meaning in the way, not only rules, but the meaning of the rules, not only the legislation, but the philosophy of the legislation, the goals, what do we want to achieve? This is what. The second means that in our society, uh, we need to deal with one of the main challenges, which is education. I was talking to some uh, uh, sisters just before the lecture. <coughs> education is critical. What are we teaching? And in which way are we teaching? What does it mean to be a good Muslim in our society now? What does it mean to be a good Christian? What does it mean to, go, to be a good student? What is efficient education? To get a job and money? <coughs> are you here to get a job and money or to have titles? Is the American dream that you are buying all about getting money and feeling good because you get money and you are following in the footsteps of Hollywood culture? Or is it something else? And if you, it is something else, of course, but you cannot just say, I'm a Muslim and I pray five times a day, and you don't ask the big question, what are you teaching to your kids? How are you going to help me in the United States of America to have a spiritual life, but at the same time to feel good in this culture? Because this culture, it's, also, it's very important. When the scholars were talking about maslaha, public interest, is how am I going to feel good? Are we creating an alternative or even a culture within a culture that is helping us to have something which is in accordance with our principles? Not the marginal culture of Islamic songs and ashid, but something which is mainstream that is helping me to feel good as, and it means what? Where are the Muslim citizens, Americans, producing novels, producing movies, producing something which is creative. One of the most dangerous things that we have in our education today in the West is lack of creativity. Lack of creativity. The Muslims are the, and, and you want to deal with Muslim creativity, what do we do there today? Say, you know what, one day, once upon a time, we were very creative. <laughs> go to Indonesia, go to see Istanbul. So, and what about uh, Prince, uh, Prince? What about this here in in America? Where is your our creativity? It's connected to a cosmology. It's producing arts and uh, a sense of beauty based on our cosmology. This is what has to be. We say Allah Jamil Yuhibul Jamal. God is beautiful and He likes beauty. Where is the beauty that we are creating here? And it's not only to, for example, when we have mosques, it's not to come with mosques that are built as we were building mosques in the Arab countries. No. In America, what is the sense of aesthetic that you have? That is saying, this is our contribution. Now you want to see something beautiful? It's here in front of you. This is our contribution. Connecting the meaning of life with our understanding of the world. This is our resistance to globalization. Social justice, exactly the same. You got a question once saying about, you know, what is your take on 
uh, Black Lives Matter. And I have some Muslim scholars and some Muslim leaders saying, you know what, it's, 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 it's not the same strike. Of course, it's all connected. You are not going to get social justice in this country. Look at this room. Where are you black or Af the black American or African American brothers and sisters or citizens here? Where are they? Why is it that when we have, we come, you go to some venues, they're all black, and in others they're all not so black. And we say, you know what, Islam is about racism. That's true. So why is it? What is the problem? Why is it that when I come today, I enter into this country first because my old relation to the United States of America at the beginning in the, in the 70s and in the 80s was with the black American, with what Malcolm X was in touch with my father. In my mind, they were the driving force of Islam. Now you come to this country and we are even asking ourselves, what is, going, what, what is our take if we want to resist? emotional politics and people saying us versus them, we have to come together to understand the struggle for justice in this society against racism, for the Latinos, for the black people, gender equality, it's all connected. It's all connected. Not only it's connected here, but don't get it right if you are. And for the people who are here, Americans, where do you come from? The great majority of you who are here are coming from the global south. Don't you think that as witnesses you have something to say about global justice? That there will be no peace in the United States of America if we are keeping on neglecting the rights of others? That you can't just ask yourself, are you going to get 25,000 refugees just to, be, to show that we are full of humanity when there are 5 million today Syrian out of their country? What is this? Don't we have to come with this one humanity, the same dignity, so we have to speak out. But as I told you, in social justice, to speak out means that you have to be courageous in a way. So our reaction to all this, it's based on the spiritual take at the beginning. It's also based on something which is, and I will end with this, Muslims should not fall into the trap of this, and I keep on repeating this, it might be that for Muslims, they should speak less about Islam and be a bit more Muslims as to the way they behave. On ethical terms, with a vision, with a cosmology, with a philosophy of life. I'm not going to fall into the trap of emotional politics, us versus them. This is your business. My answer is shared universal values. Don't tell me these are American values versus Muslim values. That's not true. This is manufactured. This is for you to create the other. We are creating a new we here in this country, but not a new we to please you. That's the opposite. You know why I'm banned from France and all this? Because I'm, I'm talking about a new we, but not to please them. It's to bother. It's to say, let us be clear. There are things here that I'm critical towards what you are saying and critical towards what Muslims and some Muslims are saying. So it's a critical take. It takes effort. It takes courage. It doesn't, it's not a new way to disappear. So anyone today who's telling you to be a good Muslim, you Muslims, try to be humble and visible and please the people. If you try to please the people at one point, pleasing the people with this rhetoric of nationalism, fear, security, is to lack self-respect. You are not respecting yourself if you try to please the people. This is the starting point of uh, the spiritual struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have given us a lot to think about, and uh, we do want to take that promised uh, intermission uh, just in time for the ending of the Maghreb prayers. And so the Maghreb uh, prayers arrangement is right outside the, this room in the hall. And we will resume in 10 minutes, and we will have about 15 minutes for some question and answer. Please do come back by 8.30. At 8.30, we're going to resume.